In my talk today, I'm actually going to present you a very specific pilot that we just recently finished. Um, and you can find more information online. Just to kind of really focus on the use case of how we're thinking about this whole space around digital currencies in general. But before diving, I do want to spend a little bit just on, you know, what is Visa? What is Visa Crypto? What are we doing? So as you guys know, you know, Visa is really in these kind of heart of infrastructure connecting between all the different payment flows. So essentially, we're payment enabler. We work with banks, with institutions, with fintechs, digital partners and stuff like that to really just be in the flow of money movement. And so as we're thinking about crypto in general, one of the natural questions to ask is, you know, what is that future of money is going to look like, right? You know, people started thinking about stable coins back in the early 2010s. And then with central banks coming in, you're looking at central bank digital currencies. Probably a lot of them are being compelled by the fact that Libra and other projects came along. And this is really how the beginning of CBDC came about. And of course, as um, Daniela and Sophia mentioned earlier, we're seeing this increasing very strong momentum around tokenization of everything, starting with cash, starting with the tokenization of deposits, um, as well as tokenization of assets. So in this, um, in this uh, I'm just gonna find the thing. Yeah, in, in, in this uh, presentation, I wanna walk you through a very specific use case that we did around CBDC, tying the CBDC of the specific use cases, what it can enable, but really in the context of tokenization and how we're thinking about it. Um, I do wanna leave some time for questions and stuff, we'll see. Um, okay. So just, and I don't have a lot of slides, by the way, so hopefully should be pretty succinct. So as I said, all of these are already being published on the official Central Bank uh, of Brazil's website under the Lift Challenge. Um, just a little bit background about what is the Lift Challenge. Um, so they initiated this um, kind of opportunity at the end of 2021. They're very futuristic in terms of how they're thinking about it. Specifically, there's two sides of what they really want to uh, understand more and hence having this very kind of interaction with the private sector. So what they're looking for one is, you know, what is that role of CBDC is going to fulfill, right? How is that going to be compatible with all of the existing payment rails? This is a very important aspect. There's no point of just rewriting the history and just rebuild a whole new set of rails to compete out the existing things. So number one thing is that compatibility and therefore the interoperability with all of the existing rails. So they want to demonstrate how CBDC could look like in that context. Secondly, what are the net new use cases and utilities a central bank digital currency can bring to the country to which um, you know, all of the existing ecosystem is not enough to deliver that? So wanting to be very futuristic. And specifically, I think, I mean, I can't remember, but they have a set of requirements. Some of the things are, for example, deliver versus payment, payment versus payment, offline capabilities, and interoperability with everything else. And actually, uh, one section as well on the, the area around DeFi. So that is the context of the Central Bank of Brazil as they kicked off that project. And um, for us, you know, we, um, you know, my team, we spend a lot of time with central banks, right? My team is around CBDC. So one of the first thing we want to understand is what are the set of specific requirements and objectives for different central banks, and then trying to figure out what the role that Visa can bring and also technology and infrastructure, we can help to demonstrate what is the art of the possible. So this is how we started. So thinking about um, Brazil, this is where we started to really trying to identify persona and specific use cases that will be relevant for Brazilian economy. This is how we came ultimately to this persona of looking at a local SME, which is in the agribusiness, and trying to build a set of infrastructures that would enable um, uh, that would enable programmable finance um, to be built for the future. So again, treating this uh, pilot or this uh, POC as very futuristic looking, but we want to show what could be. Uh, value added to the whole ecosystem as we're building out all these different infrastructures. So the, we coined the term programmable finance, of course, in being inspired by what's happening on DeFi. But here we're really looking at, you know, those that would be relevant for the B2B use cases, as well as in a contact that's more regulated and with compliance and everything involved. So what are we trying to show? And this is, I'm just going to read out a little bit, but at least like I'll explain. 
Um, so the programmable finance platform that we have enabled is to provide greater market access. And that's a really key thing, because if you think about in today's world, financing exists um, for all these uh, agribusiness and other type of local SMEs. But the financing terms are pretty bad because the, the amount of market access for a lot, a lot of these local SMEs are pretty restricted. As a local farmer, I probably face a few global conglomerates in which I can get financing. Um, and what kind of financing are we looking at? You know, if you think about yourself being a farmer, there's a lot of uncertainties in the world, right? Your crop is not going to get delivered until six months, eight months down the road. But you do need the money today in order to pay for your employee like plant all the seeds, do a lot of the fertilization, etc. So that gap in terms of finding the right financing term and who has the capital to provide that. In today's world, the market, the market structure itself is very limited for these local SMEs. And so let's think about blockchain, right? This is where we're thinking, well, if blockchain could really enable and open up that market access for someone like a local agriculture business so that they can face a global pool of investors who are happy to bid on that piece of financing. Now the story gets a lot more interesting. But also for the global pool of investors, think about the fact that I myself, I, I cannot, if I want to have exposure to soybean right today, I cannot just do that because I don't even know where to go and how would I do that. But instead, like if you're thinking about having a marketplace down the road in the future, that you could enable this two-sided markets, it becomes a really interesting thing. And I want to kind of really emphasize on the use case less about the infrastructure itself, because here I'm not saying that blockchain is the only solution that can solve for it, but certainly blockchain demonstrates it is possible because things like smart contract, like programmability that we have showcased throughout the whole exercise, demonstrate what is I said, the art of the possible. So I said, one of the main things that we want to really enable is around this market access. To so have greater market access, introduce more, more competition into the, into the market, and um, I guess ultimately you can have more better efficient price discovery process embedded into that. We also throughout this whole platform demonstrated you know, how do you facilitate uh, interoperability between a CBDC to a stable coin. In the future it could be a tokenized deposit with a CBDC or you know, CBDC between CBDCs. The, the heart of the infrastructure that we have created actually is on the right hand side is called a universal payments channel that's the piece of infrastructure that we build out that could enable all these kind of interoperability between uh, different form factors of digital currencies and then we uh, we showcase how like um, a CBDC platform that is using actually Hyperledger Bezu to build out the foundational infrastructure set could be integrated uh, back with the PIX uh, system as well uh, with the help of our partners, Synchia and Microsoft in this process. Um, and ultimately, we want to really focus on the real world applications uh, with that. But, you know, as I'm describing this uh, infrastructure and the market, marketplace and stuff like that, what does that process look like? That process then takes us to what I'm talking about on tokenization. In a sense, the challenge today is just you know, depends on the industry you're looking at. You need different processes to bring something that exists off-chain in the real world today, bring on-chain. You know, it's an oracle question or problem, if you will, but it's a matter of what does that process look like? How many steps? Who are the right regulated entities and others and partners that might be involved to bring what already exists off-chain to on-chain? And how do you package that around to change it into some other form of financial derivative or financial asset classes directly on-chain on and what kind of future new flows you may be able to drive? So that's kind of a set of, um, I guess, um, use case um, and how we're thinking about uh, to enable. So the partners that we work with um, include Microsoft, Synchia, AgroToken, in which we learned a lot uh, from the expertise of creating the tokenization uh, process, understanding what is very specific uh, to the LAC market. And I said, you know, this entire infrastructure started with using Hyperledger Bezu because, you know, we want to be very close to the EVM compatibility part, right? We want to really use the smart contract capabilities to demonstrate all of that. And hence, that's the reason why we chose um, the Bezu uh, platform to do so. One sec. Oops. Um, so yeah, so there you have it. So on, in a nutshell, you know, an SME soybean farmer is looking to do three things. And this is what we demonstrated through um, our experimentation. So basically, you know, as a local SME, 
the first thing he wanted to do, he or she wanted to do, is basically tokenize that piece of existing cooperative contract uh, into a verifiable NFT. And do, I do want to kind of like just mention, it's really interesting, right? Because in today's world, that piece of cooperative contract is literally just a piece of physical paper with a stamp. And you need to make sure that, for example, someone needs to verify the legitimacy of that and also that you do not upload this contract into different parts of the, you know, different digital um, market platforms because then you have the double counting error that's embedded to it. So it requires a very um, kind of like, um, I guess, um, controlled environment to make sure that this happens and you need to develop a process related to it. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is tokenize that piece of physical financial contract on chain um, and change it into an NFT, right? This is in which you're not, no longer looking at NFT just for like arts work or whatever. This piece of NFT represents your uh, invoice. So this is what we are looking at is really the, the factoring market um, in, in, the, in the finance and capital market. And so Traditionally, as you're doing factoring, how do you do that on-chain? So replicating that on-chain by creating this piece of verifiable NFT. And as we're building that, we also thought about, okay, what about sustainability, right? Can we add additional sort of markers or additional sort of um, information to this piece of NFT? And the answer is yes, because you can keep on adding a lot of extra metadata to as you're uploading this, as long as you, know, you have the right attestation process to make sure that it's all been checked and um, compliant to the regulation. So that's step number one around tokenization. The second piece is the super interesting one. So it's about auction the NFT to global investors to finance his harvest. And I think later slide we show a little bit more detail of that infrastructure that we build. But um, what I would encourage um, is first, what we leverage is Visa's uh, in-house technology of what we call universal payment channels. Uh, so it's really leveraging payment channels to enable, enable interoperability. And then on top of that, we build an on-chain uh, first price uh, seal bid auction mechanism directly on that. So what that means is basically me as the farmer, I load, you know, imagine I have a front-end app, right? which is the marketplace, I'll upload that piece of NFT. What I need to specify for that is, I want to put it for auction, I specify an expiration date of saying, okay, this auction um, mark is only valid for say the next five days. I then specify what's the minimum, the floor price that I would be willing to accept. I put it out there. Everything is completely automated. As soon as you upload that, you can imagine the global pool of investors, if they receive that data, they can start engaging that competitive bidding process. I guess a similar thing you can relate to is how you might potentially do it on OpenSea. Some, if some of you have bought NFT before, it's, you know, we're taking inspiration from that. But here it's looking at very much a B2B use case. So once the, the auction is done, then you have a set of things, which is payment versus payment, delivery versus payment, transaction is gonna take place. I don't want to go into the detail, but this is exactly where we use smart contract to showcase how you can do everything atomically. So what do I mean by atomicity? Atomicity basically says if one leg of that transaction fails, every single leg of the transaction will not go through. What's the benefit of that? It means that in the future, if you do atomic settlement, you remove counterparty risk altogether, right? Because if you think about it, in today's world, things take T plus two days to settle or even longer to settle. In between that time, like you might imagine another bank like SVB go out, right? You do face that counterparty risk. Now, on the smart contract, as we're leveraging programmability, that's exactly one of the key things that central bank is really keen to explore around this notion of atomicity, elim eliminating risk in the marketplace and really trying to protect both, I guess, the sender and recipient front of the fund flows. So this is what we demonstrated. And then the last piece is paying the employees offline. Um, I would highlight, you know, we also uh, re um, launched a set of research into offline payments back in 2020. It's really a piece of research, but we're happy to share these information. But um, I do see that in the world of CBDC, there's a strong demand by central banks as they're looking at uh, what does this feature of CBDC could look like. Some central banks very much focus on this notion of a digital version of cash in the sense it can be offline, 
you know, imagine if you're in a remote region, whether you're skiing, whether you're in like a really remote region trying to pay your employee, you can't count on the fact that you have uh, internet, but can I still transact in a digital way? The answer is yes, and there's a version to create offline payments. Um, so countries, I guess, in a lot of the emerging markets, but also countries that have uh, prone to natural disaster like Japan, right? They're actually very much into these kind of offline payments. And from the visa perspective, I think we're keen to uh, promote more research because our visa research team has been heavily involved in a lot of the development and, uh, you know, would be happy to push for more standardization around this industry um, to see how it evolves. Oops, sorry. I just want to give you a view of what that digital marketplace looks like. Uh, it's really just generic, but you can imagine this is the front end facing in which, you know, as a local SME having like an app with his exist existing bank, you know, maybe one day he can receive a notification that says, okay, let me create my business CBDC account, right? I can convert some of my existing money, my savings account, whatever, into that one. And by the way, I said, in the future, this could easily be replaced rather than a CBDC, a retail CBDC can be replaced by a bank's tokenized deposits or stablecoin equivalent uh, as you like. And then the next phase is really about the NFT creation, as you can see that is about uh, how I can upload the piece of, well, we have more flows and there's a YouTube uh, recording of that if you want to go into that um, and I'm happy to share the, the link. So there's going to be a whole flow around NFT creation to show you the process of that Oracle process of bring something off chain to on chain and lastly is about paying uh, paying your uh, employee uh, offline and actually sorry I just realized all of these are video links but I think it's a PDF format so unfortunately I can't show you that um, but let me go in a little bit into the technical design aspect and I think I kind of mentioned that in a round, but you know, just to keep track, because it is a pretty complicated flow, right? We are trying to really demonstrate a persona and use end-to-end uh, -to, -end to flow to really describe where does the CBDC comes in, how do you leverage smart contract programmability, and fundamentally, what does that programmable finance represents? So breaking those down into three different kind of components of what we have built directly and or with partners. So number one is around this notion of a digital currency payments infrastructure. And crucially, as said, within this, we heavily leverage Visa solution, which is the Visa's universal payment channels to enable interoperability for the payment versus payment, but also building that on-chain auction mechanism directly using the payment channels. The benefit of that is that you can run this thing automatically, the auction mechanism automatically, and once the bidding is completed and you find who is the highest bidder, you can then transact that piece of NFT uh, with the money. So this is the delivery versus payment flow that we have demonstrated. And then the second process is around this notion of um, asset tokenization. As said, we demonstrated that flow step by step uh, with the advice of our partner AgroToken in this process uh, to really understand and demonstrate how as a local SME business owner, you can upload your physical piece of CPR on chain through the set of process that is involved. And then the last piece is really like having the compliance uh, in mind and really think about identity. This is where we leveraged um, our partners, Microsoft and Syncia's uh, digital identity solutions to do with D uh, DDIs as well as verifiable credentials to demonstrate that aspect. So just to kind of finish off, um, therefore, of what we have accomplished for the BCBs, and I think, um, you know, like as Daniela said in the introduction, Brazil is probably one of the most advanced countries in terms of uh, exploring the potential of a CBDC. They're very forward looking and we've spent like a decent, I think almost a year working with them through this pro uh, project. So it's very nice to have the insight view of understanding how they're thinking about it. I think in general, there's just a lot of innovations that um, as the private sector, we need to actively really explore. But the key always goes back to what is the exact use case we're looking at and specifically what kind of pain points that we're trying to address. That's, that's I think, ultimately it's going to be very important to really figure out how is your go-to-market solution is going to look like. So what we accomplished during this lift challenge is really four folds. First, number one, promoting competition and capital efficiency. As I spent quite a bit of time at the beginning, you know, the, the whole thing is about opening up market access 
for both sides, for both the local SMEs, but also for the fact that in the future, global investors have better access directly into local markets, into different asset classes that they want to have exposure to. And I do think this is one of the main drive for tokenization in general, right? As we're bringing all of these real world assets on chain, fractionalize it, or like bring more liquidity, use it for other collateral management, etc. It's all about the market access. Um, the second thing that we have accomplished is really complementing existing payments and crop financing infrastructure. Um, didn't show it in this slide, but I said we have some more materials um, online that demonstrated how we are able to integrate this CBDC system uh, with the existing PIX RTP system through Syncia, who is one of the partners that we work with through this process. The third one is very important for us, which is foster that develop developer-friendly ecosystem uh, which attracts uh, innovation to Brazil. And specifically, we have made a very deliberate choice to use Hyperledger Bezu for this process because we do want to demonstrate that EVM compatibility and write everything in Solidity and to build out the smart contract with the payment channels we wrote in order to demonstrate all these kind of cool novel things like uh, auction market designs and stuff like that. And then last but not the least, you know, support Brazil central bank's initiatives of inclusion, sustainability, open banking and competition. And I mean, it's really a baby step of what we showed um, through this project. But I do think that as you can bring more different attributes on chain, that in the future, as you're thinking about sustainability, inclusion, market access, etc., there's a whole new scope in which what you can build and enable. So uh, yeah, we're super excited and uh, we'll keep doing more work in this, in this field, and that's it. Thank you, everyone. I think, how long do we have? I think we have some time for questions. If, uh... Hi, uh, very nice presentation. Um, just kind of curious about the results um, in terms of, you know, is this already launched and um, have the farmers uh, been able to tokenize their, their crops yet and uh, you know, actually get the global investors to uh, start purchasing or, or is this something that's going to be launched um, later? Sure. Um, so this is very much like we build a prototype that's functional in our own environment. This is definitely not a product. And we don't know yet where this is going because a lot of the components that I show you out there, um, you know, it's not assuming that Visa will build out these specific components, for example, the front end, the marketplace. Um, and we welcome, you know, the collaboration with other market players to really figure out this holistic ecosystem. And I think for us, what we want to focus on more is around the interoperability for cross-border payments, etc. You know, I said between CBDC, stablecoins, CBDC, tokenized deposit, etc. And how do you do it to enable seamless cross-border flows? Those are the things that we want to help to enable for our partners and stuff. So, yeah. Thank you.